I just want to introduce some stuff on Chris. I'm not going to email you. Yeah, is there anything I should do just to prepare for it? Well, no, I'll be bringing it to the um, yeah, it's just a video. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hi, how are you? I'm Chris. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Lisa. Um, I think we're going to get started. So if everybody wants to take a seat, that would be great. And if you're presenting or pitching tonight, it'd be great if you use that as first or second rows when we get Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started. Um, welcome to our uh, our first in-person town hall since January 2020. Um, and this is our first hybrid uh, speaking town hall, so we are live on Facebook right now. Um, so for those of you watching at home, I hope you can hear and see us. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Lisa Gold. I'm the executive director of A4, the Asian American Arts Alliance. And um, tonight's event is uh, around art and climate, and we just happen to be in the middle of climate week. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with A4, you know that we are are dedicated to ensuring greater representation, equity, and opportunities for AAPI artists and arts organizations. Um, and we do that through research sharing, promotion, conversations, and events like this, where we build community and amplify each other's work. Um, just kind of curious, how many of you have been to a town hall before in your region yet? Couple? Wow, okay. You not not a whole lot. So um, for those of you who haven't been to a town hall before, I'm going to tell you how tonight's going to go. So uh, we have two featured presenters, and we have two groups of short one minute pitches. Um, and then I'm going to ring the bell. As you know, I will ring at the end of each uh, one minute marker. Um, and then after every group, so we will have our first featured presenter. We will have a group of one minute presenters. We will repeat the whole thing over again with our second feature presenter and our one minute pitches. And then at the end, if there's anybody here who is so moved that they want to get up and share their work or talk about what they're working on, they can give a 30 second pitch. So if you want to do that, just uh, stand up here, write your name and your, um, your handle or your website, and then you can go with your 30 second pitch and I'll time you for that too. Uh, that's lots of announcements. So, um, Really excited, like I said, that you're here tonight. So after everybody pitches and whatnot, we're just gonna have some networking. You know, if you all remember how to do that, I feel like I've forgotten a little bit busty here. Um, so a uh, couple of quick, quick announcements and some housekeeping. So a um, special thanks to our staff, uh, uh, Justine, me, our programs director, and I'm sure, uh, and Shannon, you want to go to check in people. Thank you. Recording this will be available on our YouTube channel later, as with all of our programs and channels there on our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to so if you want to share, just tag us with um, hashtag A4 Town Hall. Um, if you need a restroom, it is out the door around the corner to the right, right, right. And um, if you have a phone, please silence it so that we don't interrupt other people's presentations. Um, and then also if you could do us a favor and fill out this post event survey, you can um, use this QR code to fill it out. It really helps us. It helps us understand uh, what we want, what we're doing better, what we could do better. Um, if you have an idea for a town hall or you want to present something, you can add that on the on the survey as well. Um, this is my dog, Maka. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce her. She's a very important part of the community. Um, so a couple of upcoming events. Thank you. <laughs> um, on Tuesday, uh, September 27th at 4 30, we're we'll partnering with the Berlin Arts Council uh, for an information session about their upcoming grant cycle. So, if you are a Portland artist, Portland based artist, you should apply for one of these grants and get that money. It stands for you. And if you happen to be a Queens resident, uh, Washington Town Hall has their art grants for Queens launched. Actually, they're now open. 
Um, and they also have a bunch of information sessions you can attend for the Lucy University team that I'll have to check those out too. Um, on October 6th, Thursday, we are hosting that not that live in person. Um, to make the artists of our inaugural What Can We Do micro grant program. So these are 30 artists who each received $500 grants to do a project in their community that exhibited a form of care, creative care, and the range of projects. Some of the artists are here tonight to talk about their projects. Um, they're just amazing, the scope, and they're so interesting and they're so different. Um, so we're really excited about that. We're also going to talk about the next round of grants too. So if you're really inspired by what you hear at that event and you want to sign up, you can apply. Very, very easy application, and we'll have all that information on October 6th. Um, and I'd like to make a quick plug for our friends and materials from the arts who could not be here tonight. Um, they are very busy saving the planet and uh, rescuing tons and tons and tons of material from uh, landfill. But their organization is part of the Department of Cultural Affairs, and it is a giant warehouse of materials that are donated from chairs and binders to sequins and carpets and Christmas trees and theater lights and all sorts of things that you can use in your art projects and you can go there and shop there for free as long as you are connected with an organization I paid for that happens to be a member. So if you want to know more information about um materials for the art you can just check with me or just even after um after the event here. And then um just uh, another pitch reminder to please share your work with us on um, the A4 community website. We have um, a community calendar and we'd love to post opportunities and events and it's free to use and share. So please um, make use of it. And uh, as always, I want to thank our, our many, many sponsors, Con Edison, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the uh, City Council, um, the New York State Council on the Arts. Uh, with the support of Governor Kathy Hochul and the New York State Legislature, um, the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Community Trust, the Howard Gilman Foundation. There's a lot of, a lot of sponsors here. They're very, very fortunate. Um, wasn't always the case. Um, and let's see, Gila Fiskers. We have some free Fisker scissors for you tonight if you want to take on a great set of scissors. Um, the Tier Foundation and so many generous individuals uh, for making tonight and all of our programs possible. Um, if you want to be one of our supporters, you can text to donate or you can go to our website. Um, we appreciate all of that. So um, very quickly, I'd like to offer just a brief plan acknowledgement because we are here on the unceded lands of Monsi Lenape Mercy Peoples. Um, and there are many people that are joining us virtually, and we are all occupying different physical spaces. So I'm going to share a land acknowledgement that was written by Canadian theater artist Adrian Wong, who is a digital land acknowledgement. So those things our activities are shared digitally to the internet, but also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We're using equipment and high-speed internet that are not available in many indigenous communities. And even the technologies that are central to much of the art that we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide as we have just seen what happened in um, Puerto Rico and Alaska. Um, I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. So with that, um, I would like to introduce our first featured presenter, um, the incredibly talented Jean Shin. Uh, Jean is probably best known for her very large scale installations and public sculptures where she transformed often discarded or not to be materials into these epic, um, beautiful objects. She uses pill bottles and lottery tickets. And I think I've seen wine bottles and pants trimmings and people's clothes and all sorts of things over the years. I've mentioned for a long time, I've been a huge admirer of her work. Um, she did a beautiful installation when I worked at Socrates, South um, Park, this beautiful penumbra made of um, discarded uh, umbrella skins. So anyway, um, Jean was born in Seoul, South Korea, and she works between Brooklyn and Hudson Valley. And she's a tenured adjunct professor at Pat and holds an honorary doctor from the New York Academy of Art. Um, in addition to all of those things that I just said, her work has um, been widely exhibited and collected in over 150 major museums and cultural institutions, 
including um, MoMA, the Museum of um, the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C., which is a great solo show, the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I give you two shoes. <laughs> Welcome by Lisa. Um, she was working at Dr. T's and I made one of my earliest first installations outdoors. Um, so it's a pivotal to remember the community and these amazing nonprofits that give you the first opportunity. And really still that impact um, of taking a project. And I wasn't gonna do this, but here I am <laughs> talking about um just rescuing umbrellas from the street. And it was a, a venture going out when it storms. And it stormed a lot, but now it's storming more. And in ways that I would not feel safe, right? But I was um, seeing that in my walks around New York City, I would see these broken umbrellas, and people would just abandon them. You know, of course, we're running for shelter, we get that. But like, why do you throw this thing out? <laughs> you know, why not take it home with you and let it dry and use it the next time it comes in handy and helps you out of the way? So I thought this tragic affinity to these. Um, Things that were beautiful and really shelter us and so necessary. But then the minute they serve to get you to safety outdoors, they're just waste. Um, and of course, they're you know um, about obsolescence, so they are driven to be cheaper, cheaper, buy once, use once, and go out. And so I started to uh, and reimagine people were literally telling me, okay, I'll record a prince in Soho, you could pick up like 10 of them are stacked all over the place, and I'm told, just drive them into my station wagon and then take them to the studio and watch them do something. But it was a project of mending. I was, you know, remaking, reimagining what it had, not just to have an umbrella that you hold in time and space, a lot of things that like a collective umbrella to be um, thinking about this object, not just when we need it, when it's useful to us, that it's essential. But really to be like, what is the life of this thing? How can we reimagine it? Well, maybe this huge canopy that gave shelter and shade and sunlight, you know, because it's something who's never like rain or umbrella, you know, but actually it's shadow. It's this beautiful, you know, way of framing uh, our environment and food. And it's so was almost epic, like venture out into the unknown, doing outdoor sculpture for the first time harnessing the wind and the sunlight. And so from that first project, I learned lean into the unknown, do the thing that feels a little crazy. And it's like, well, I'm out in the rain, like people should be going for shelter. And I'm like rescuing no. Um, so I go into this project because this is now another point in my career where I've had an opportunity to support the Philadelphia Contemporary and another space, incredible institution that um, has offered me to do, where do you want to go in this conversation? And here is the river. So the Delaware River was their site. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And um, in my research, um, of course, we think about its connection. It's one of those longest um, non-dammed rivers, which is so critical to the ecosystem. So fish stream uh, swim up. But I was also thinking about what's not here that we don't see um, and loss. So, um, the picture of the freshwater mussels that have been harvested, mostly like over harvested in the Mississippi, where they got to the point where it was like a gold rush, they just take as much as you want, and they literally depleted the entire ability to see this. So, lesson learned uh, Philadelphia didn't have that opportunity because we have other pollutions, industrial waste, <laughs> literally um, destroying our ecosystem, including the freshwater mussels. So, but they were doing this because we wanted mussels um, to be. Um, pearl button shells that were sorry, that was good one. Did that work? Yeah. Um, anyway, they, they fresh water mussels were coming from all over the world, including Asia. So then, then they didn't need to import it. They could just go directly to the rivers in America. Uh, next slide. Um, oh, I wanted to go back for a second. I wanted to mention that materials for the arts, this is how amazing they are. Like, I've been seeing artists in residence there, but then I said, hey, we're looking for a carbon 
things are made on shelves and they're like like shelves of plastic and they're like well we'll look for it <laughs> Maybe you know by chance we might have some unhappy to come in and report, and then they go, well, why don't you call this manufacturer who who we picked up from? They have a whole warehouse, and so I went directly to the source, and literally the guy had said, I know exactly what you're talking about. It was like a secret warehouse, <laughs> and I've been told to hold on to it precious, you know. And then of course, but I'll get the call next year to um, so take it after the want. So in the middle of this project, I was talking about this off, and we never able to see these shelves. They actually randomly went with like the trove of hidden muscle shelf buttons that have been saved, thinking this is so important for us to have and just like gold to no one wanting them ever again because we have plastic. You know, it's cheaper. It's you know, so anyway, the fact that they are, were like extinct now and sitting there unused made my heart just sing. So anyway, we go to the next slide. This project is really in collaboration to the book that is going on in the Delaware River, which is ecologists, the scientists that are really creating hatcheries and really investing in freshwater mussels because they filter the water. So when they looked at um, how do we save the river and our freshwater and clean water, um, our ecosystem and the growing infrastructure, they went to the mussels because it starts there. And then if there's fresh water and fish come by. They use the fish to go upstream and continue to populate, you know. And of course, even the waste becomes a nutrient to fertilize before they would um, have more species to grow and the erosion to stop. So it's an incredible project. I was able to work with scientists who donated um, their um, mussels that they have bred in the laboratory, um, which is amazing. So this is huge achievement that they can actually do the work of nature for nature and then reintroduce the habitat. Um, next slide. Um, and so they allowed us to find um, and locate places where mussels were living um, organically or nutrients and often dying. So then we collected these with the volunteers um, locally to find sites and to find them dead um, and to see that like, they could be living 100 years and yet they're not able to. Okay? Um, and storms like the last but hurricane that walk went through your boat have to wash the rock these back out. Um, so we know it's going to happen, you know, around the river for this fall. And so what I wanted to do is take inspiration from the scientific kind of research um, that, that they were showing. And so this is one picture that I just fell in love with. This is the clarity after like you know a day, the muscles in there are able to purify the water. You know, just what they do. There are engineers focus to it, so they're propagating them here, and you know how beautiful they are in the labs. And I said, why don't we think about this and design this together? How can I present what they're doing by their labs and to the sculpture? So my idea was to um, create not just a square aquarium tank for the scientific labs, but this hand blown box, which feels like a breath of air that artists would put into the space. So I worked with this masterful um, glass artist in Philadelphia to hand blow these um, glass vessels that become the aquarium. And then I have like visuals about this organic space, the new ecosystem, the reimagined ecosystem where the muscles would be incredibly happy uh, to be um, in this water, filtering out the water, the water would go from hard vessels to water, and including um, our entire planet. And the next slide. So here's the manifestation of this incredible collaboration with so many people, engineers, scientists, um, and glass blowers, um, and really deeply with all the contemporary to make this living, breathing sculpture uh, that goes, pumps the water out from this cutter and trickles it down to this um, system very, very slowly from one vessel to another. And I love that slowness of watching, you know, the slowness of anticipating whether the water will get filtered. And the fun fact, they filter 10 to 15 gallons, one muscle a day. So that's a lot of water that they're just doing to survive. That's water. Um, so if you look, they're also like uh, this shape and form are almost like hourglasses because they think of them as time, um, and both in like the time that they occurred to restore their habitat, uh, the time for them to you know, 
reconciling their loss because they've been thrown in a lavatory, and, um, but also during the climate crisis. Like, how much time do we have for this work to really take effect? And you can see this beautiful, mm -hmm. this is the Eastern Pond um, Mothal, and then the ale one as well. These two species that they have really been having huge success in appropriating in the laboratories. And they were um, a few out of the 15, you know, or less um, native mussels that are still living, all the rest of the hundreds are extinct. Um, and then this connection to the 12 buttons, because I was in the middle of my project and then um, I literally landed with a warehouse full of um, pearl buttons that were not used. I imagine this like kind of ancestors and fossils wishing for the livelihood of the next generation that didn't come from nature, but they dead to be pearl. So I so needed them with the whole team of people creating these pearl kits. Um, so you can see both see the beauty of that, but also how our desire to have this like fancy button, which was the coveted thing in the 1800s. If you had a fancy pearl button, it was so chic, so like couture, um, but yet devastating because we couldn't enjoy them for being buried in the rivers a lot, filtering up water. We didn't have a campsite. Um, we, with anything fashion was the thing that one, one wants to have to the point where uh, it destroys the entire ecosystem. So my work has always been connected to this overconsumption, you know, the desire for something and not really thinking about the consequences of epic, like 20 years, 100 years later, we can never have a fresh water mustard living, not one just for us to eat because they're um, ocean cousin, which to this is their tradition. So this is really for our larger ecosystem. Um, and then I um, also thought of like the dead, um, what, what are the conditions today of the work that instead of this kind of idyllic ecosystem that um, could, could exist but doesn't exist today. Uh, so the waste. So I also work with Rare, which is also another nonprofit, and it was um, a residency in a dump, essentially, a recovery center in Philadelphia. So they're also right next to a super fun site. So this is all happening along the river downstream. So um, we're able to capture some of the waste and create sculptures um, along the, the dead shells that are found along the river as well. Um, so that was wood and we also um, used, I thought of them as like little shelves that you can get water samples. So we wanted people to really understand the river from the experiential. What is your water quality? Like, how do you have access to it? And so people who are volunteers as well as students who come through with the public can give me a water sample and add it to the sculpture. So this is really about the present condition. Um, and so, of course, we went from wood and from industrial life to metal. Not only this can still be recyclable, but it can still be compostable to a certain degree. And the next um, important waste product is plastics. Um, the next image is forever with us. You know, it degrades, but it's for, forever with us. It doesn't go anywhere. It just kind of spreads and becomes part of the ecosystem within us. So um, this is where our previous work around the water pollution has been really has impacted about plastic waste. Um, how we're just using this product as if it's the save all and cheap, convenient thing. But the true cost is that we're actually consuming it back when it ends up not being recycled, but um, ending up in an ocean waves, the fish, either the meat, the fish becomes airborne. It is impossible for it to go away, and yet we keep introducing more. Um, yeah, the, so this is a living laboratory, so it continues to change. Um, um, I'm going to be giving a talk on October 20th, so I'm excited to see after the sun this allergy has taken over. Uh, so it's creating new life as well as filtering through um, um, with the nutrients. Um, so the glass forms are really changing color. So I thought we would be seeing clear water. But of course, nature has their plans. <laughs> so I'm like an experiment. Um, some new element has grown and growing really rapidly. Water is getting hotter and hotter. So the sunlight is really intense. Uh, so the water is appear and it's also produced more algae and algae is a problem. So climate change is one of those things like 
your team on the web and to kind of call safety of those muscles and really, really key on how they kind of migrate the back to safety, back into the river system, get embedded into that canal before the winter comes, um, if the winter is cold enough. Right? So I think when we're talking about art, I'm an actually my uh, hope for this project is not only to see the beauty of this infrastructure that happens in nature um, to solve its own problems, but now it's a big update too. And I feel like we need to kind of intervene and help um, and scientists are figuring out that art can also do that for our people. So here's this beautiful river, and this is what most people think of is like, oh, the Delaware River, the river's so beautiful. And yes, it is. Uh, and I think that is. Be healthier for us, and they can be part of the healing process and the healthy system of creating habitat um, and not just for aesthetics. So, thank you so much. Such an amazing, um, I'm sure you all have talked to the GCG afterwards, and we'll have um, our, our socializing situation uh, after that. So, um, all right, so now we're going to get into our very quick one minute pitches. So, uh, in order, Christopher Lin, uh, Shinjana Mouj, uh, Juman Yang, Jimmy Yang, uh, Lucy Wang, and Shayan Concepcion. So, that's the order. Um, if you uh, are ready to go, uh, Christopher, are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm going to do this, and then um, I will start our timer. Get her up there. All right, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Christopher Lin. Um, I'm an artist with a background in research science, and I'm showing a project here that um, I'm doing uh, for the United Nations at a show called Reconnections and Friendship with Nature. Um, this is a project that um, I've worked with uh, a sample of soil that was bioactive and a number of organisms, um, invertebrates like um, worms and isopods that I do uh, eat decaying material. Uh, my work generally um, involves collaborations with non-human organisms and wider ecologies. So I became really interested in the idea of worms as a metaphor for how we can process difficult histories and uh, complicated realities. Um, so this work uh, takes the perspective of the land and how it sees our geopolitics. Um, so over the course of the installation, um, as you can see, there's rapid growth, there's decay, there's regeneration. So even though these uh, human matters seem to decay, there's a lot of life that seems to burst forward. Um, so there's life from the seeds, as well as some of the things that I Hi, um, I'm um, a collaborator. It's hard to work with you. So, we've, uh, we've had our first year growing uh, sugar kelp, cultivated sugar kelp in the Newtown Sea, which separates uh, Queens and Brooklyn. It's a highly polluted uh, waterways um, that very few people have access to. And, um, you know, in other waters, you see seaweed just grown naturally, but you now in our polluted waters, you know, um, The reason we're doing this is because uh, seaweed acts as both restoration and creating habitats for life, but also for radiation. It extracts, um, it extracts the excess nitrogen and phosphorus that goes from our sewage system, excess sewage from our sewage runoff from the city into the water. But it's also extracting um, heavy metals that's been in the water and it still it continues to go into the water. Um, it was a kind of a big surprise that anything like kelp grew in the water. So we're very happy and we'll be doing more water.
Hi everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Julie Yan. I'm a face based choreographer. I'm here today to invite you to my uh, new production. Uh, it's called Young Be Rules. Uh, it's going to be uh, on October 1st um, at Face the Miracle Garden. It's about, I interviewed over 20 uh, immigrants about their experience and created this performance. I um, uh, really want to share with the community. And uh, I'm also doing a fundraising for the production course. And if you are interested in uh, helping us, uh, please scan this code or go to my uh, Instagram uh, uh, at jimmy.art. Uh, thank you very much. And I uh, hope to see you somewhere there. Hi, my name is Lucy Mayun and I would like to I learned that I'm an interior designer in the city and I learned that seating is never healthy. There's no healthy way to sit. I and so I want to challenge myself to make a chair that really promotes people wellness. So I make this chair that is made of three parts, and there are two orientations. Here you can see uh, one of the lower orientation, and the other one is the upright position. And so you can physically interact with this, so it promotes movement. And at the same time, the chair is like a puzzle. Even though it looks simple, everyone who has tried the chair found that the puzzle to assemble and reassemble because of the slightly different angles. Um, so with this chair, it was a study on how to make a chair that is truly healthy. And just one more thing about sustainability, the chair is made of ash wood, which was in danger, and the paint actually is melting. So it's a totally edible material. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, Hi everyone, I'm Shannon Concepcion and I'm an artist in New York. I create craft inspired sculptures, um, public art installations, and functional objects. And I'm here to pitch um, my project, Discipline St. Malo, which is at Socrates Sculpture Park in Queens. I'm hoping to find a new home for it after the show ends in March. Um, it's the first permanent Asian American settlement in the United States is what my, my sculpture celebrates. And it's an architectural installation um, modeled after Baha Kubo, which is a Filipino architectural style. Um, this reference kind of just honors how communities have been dealing with climate change through stilted architecture and our beautiful hat-shaped ease. Um, and it's a testament to how we thrive amongst those environments through through rising waters and uh, St. Malo is actually sinking as we speak and in this life lifetime it's going to be completely gone. So before it's completely gone, I wanted to create a space that should that's great. So help me find its home. <laughs> Um, okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so that was the first round. Um, and now I would like to introduce our second featured presenter, uh, born in Bangkok, Thailand, um, and raised in uh, Sweden. Uh, Sarah Chikpatsuk is a singer, producer, and multimodal artist. Uh, after three years of climate research and self discovery, Sarah Tick has issued her sophomore release entitled Carbon. Um, tonight, she is going to perform a few tracks of her new album, which hopes to generate a new kind of conversation around climate. So, we have a performance tonight. We don't always have a performance. So, uh, I can please do. How's everyone doing? Hey. Hey. So great to be here. Yes. Also, thank you. 
Um, so my name is Serenity. I was born and raised in Bangkok, Thailand. And um, when I was 11, I moved to Sweden, in Stockholm, because my mom is Swedish and my dad is Thai. And for the past eight years, I've been living here in New York City. Um, I also have my collaborator here with me, Nisha Botong. Um, she's an interdisciplinary artist. So the art that you see here is actually designed by Nisha. Um, I went to World College of Music in Stockholm, and then I did my master's degree here in New York City. And I don't know if any of you guys are Asian immigrants. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you know, you can't just move to the US. It's, it's a pretty complicated process. So I came here to study jazz. I love jazz. And um, growing up in Thailand, I was introduced to a lot of Thai, Thai traditional music. And I, actually, my first instrument was a Thai instrument. They call a saw. And then I also played a key, which is a different, I wish I could show it. It's kind of like a harp, but guitar, but you hit it on the sticks. It's a different type of thing. And then I continued to play classical piano and violin. And then I started singing. And then I fell in love with jazz as a teenager. And which better place in the world to study jazz? It's New York City. But once I came here and once I started to study from the high school music, I really understood how much of it is an African American tradition and how I actually could best enter the music space and add to the jazz world by bringing in my Thai influences and my Swedish influences. So what I'm doing with my music for the past four years is to work with that combination of how can I use Thai tuning in my music? How can I use Thai language? How can I use Thai instruments and also combine it with pop, which is what Sweden focuses on. It's a songwriting country. Um, if you've ever heard like the Katy Perry kids or Rihanna, whoever, whoever, it's written most likely by a guy called Max Martin and he writes hits. So in Sweden, there are hit music writing schools. So you go there to learn how to write hits. That's a thing. It is a thing. Um, so I'm trying to combine that with jazz. So my music is kind of all over the place. Um, but right now, what I'm here today is to talk about my new album, which is coming out on October 14th. And for this one, I also really wanted to work on how to bring in climate change into my music. I started to write my first song about climate change back in 2010 when I was asked to perform at a fundraiser for Haiti. They had a really, really bad earthquake. So I wrote my first song was like a 19 year old. No, it wasn't my first song. My first song was when I was 12, my first song about climate change. And it was called Save Haiti. And after the performance, there was someone in the audience who said, You know what? I've seen so much about this on the news, but nothing made me really empathize with the earthquake as much as your song. And that's when I realized the power of music. And then I tried to explore that for like a decade, but because it's such a polarizing topic, if you really, at least with music, put it in the lyric and tell someone you should recycle or whatever it could be, a lot of people might not want to listen to it. So I try to find ways of how can I make it connect with more people? How can I try to go through the numbness that is already happening all the time, you go on social media, you go on the news, you're feeling all these things and feeling like you're not doing enough. So what I did was to explore um, different topics and building them into the songs. So one of the songs is about the rise of global temperature. So I took data from NASA's website and I used something called data sonification, which would translate data into pitches. So each specific pitch is a year and a temperature. Um, but if you've seen any kind of diagram of rise of temperatures, it kind of goes like this. And then for the past few decades, it's also good. So I felt like that would be very like, predictable as a song to just. Um, so I decided to take some artistic liberty and choose years that were significant to me and our society as a whole. So then we can play that in a video. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, while I was pulling up the track, um, I also did a song about air pollution. In Bangkok, this is a really big issue, especially during the winter. 
um, months. So for that one, um, you can see here, this is the air pollution data of January and uh, February. Uh, February. Uh, February. And um, these are different days. So what we did in this one is that using data application with different types of tools that exist, we used that the worse the uh, air pollution was, the more dissonant the interval, and the better the day was, like that 55 day, the more harmonious the interval was. And because the data was coming from Thailand, we played this with Tai Chi that my friend came to that all the way back to the place in the band. Um, he managed to put into his module a synthesizer. Um, but let's go back to the ABC video. Yeah. We yeah. just want to watch a short clip of this. Thing I like to do is to use data as a starting point for my compositions. Here, for instance, NASA's website with a timeline of the average global temperature from 1880. First, I download data. Then I import it into this web app, which turns data sets into musical information. I choose a key and load my composition based on the mood I want to communicate. As I listen to the musical data and play back, I create different patterns based on years that are significant to me, throughout history and my personal life. When I'm happy with the dates I selected, I play the resulting notes on the keyboard. Then replace the sound with samples on my voice to make it even more personal. This process reduces the pressure of starting from scratch. It helps me create copies. Um, so that was just a version of that. I usually do live looking at one of the lives, but because of time limit here, I'm not doing that today. Um, but that was a way to use data application in a more common way, and the interval one is a different one. So we can go back to the other slide. Oh, we're doing on time. I like we have, we've got a few more minutes. Okay. Um, so the other topics on the record is like plastic pollution, like what we were mentioning. So what I did was I took plastic trash from my kitchen and I turned it into percussion set. So the song is not about plastic pollution at all, but the drum was on plastic. So if you listen to it, you're like, oh, that's a really cool drum set. What's that? Then the idea is that people research it and then they learn about it and then it becomes a conversation and then we can kind of continue to do some change based from there. Um, I'm going to skip, skip all this. So I have, um, actually go back to that. Part. Yeah. So um, throughout this process too, what I've been doing is figure out how to make my practice more sustainable. So it's not just the talking about it but it's implemented into my work. So what we did back in June was a solar power performance. Um, and I also recorded the album at a solar powered recording studio. And I'm right now trying to print my vinyls on bioplastic. So there are a lot of ways to do this if you just start to think outside of the box. And I think that as us as artists, that's something that we can Try to implement just like how can be more sustainable because it really kind of inspires you to be more creative. Um, and then I also went on an artistic residency with a crew of scientists out on the North Pacific for two weeks. I was on a ship with 25 scientists from Oregon State University and the University of Oregon, and they were studying plankton. And it was really, really cool to work with them and to write the music based on what they did. What they did is data supplication again. I created soundtracks for their videos and um, created voices for these organisms that we don't see. Phytoplankton creates 40 to 60% of all oxygen on Earth. So they're pretty significant. And that's kind of going to be the next part of this journey that I want to go with scientists, work with them firsthand, and really make sure that everything I do is well researched. Uh, so. Do we want to hear a song or do we not have time? Well, let's do a song. Yeah, yeah, I, song. Like three minutes. 
I didn't know you could hold against the pages for one minute. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's let's keep the song. Yeah, I feel so much prepared. Next time. You can follow me and then we can end. Do you want to hear an upbeat song or so? Upbeat. Upbeat. Let's do red eyes. Okay, so this one is called Red Eyes and the inspiration point was endangered. Tigers, a lot of endangered animals are Sumatra in Indonesia, but because I was born in Thailand, I was researching um, endangered animals in Thailand. Uh, the Indo Chinese tiger in Thailand was endangered. So, this is red eyes, stand for the laser of the hunter's gun that protects us. <laughs> Much money to dance. Yes, <laughs>
Uh, all right, so next uh, is our second round of one minute pictures. So um, your names are up here. So get ready to go. We're starting with uh, Daniel Shea. Woo! Shea. Uh, uh, Nat Cartanto. Paul um, Chico. Joyce Ma. Carisha. Oh, Carisha's not with us, but Maria. So um, yeah, we'll do that. So uh, Daniel, are you here? You ready? Okay. We got a minute. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel yeah, Kay. I'm an artist based in New York. Um, I'm also here to pitch my project at Socrates and also trying to find a new home for it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so this sculpture um, is titled Passage to TOI 700D, which is the name of a planet that NASA found two years ago, about 100 light years from here, and has the potential to contain water. So that's the nature of the become like Earth. So we can go to the next slide. So it's kind of like this uh, portal object that ranks up in the sky. And at the end, you can see a sky that is different from the one around you. And so I kind of wanted to work on this object um, to think about this like romantic idea of finding a second Earth, that the idea that we can't find a second Earth, and it's like unquestionable that we must go there. And sort of thinking back to how it relates to like parts of U.S. history, like Manifest, Manifest Destiny and uh, Frontierism, and this, um, these ideas that led to the um, colonization of the American West. So, um, yeah, so I'm thinking about, like, if we do find a second year, like, who gets this over this earth? Who does this earth belong to? Thank you. Are you here? Yes. I'm Sharon. Um, and thanks for okay, both for supporting uh, me and our others. Uh, so there's a crisis for young artists in the city looking for physical space to show their work because of high rent prices. So I propose that empty storefronts and these empty spaces can be transformed into places to host art events. Uh, the benefit to the owners would be to increase visibility for their spaces and uh, contribute to the art scenes for artists to have a free space and for the community to enjoy more art events and uh, strengthen their connections. And so this is a project Double Vision is working on and I'm looking for a site. Uh, it's an immersive art installation. I'm looking for a place that can host it for a day or evening um, or weekend. And it's supported by an RBCC grant and it's meant for uh, children and adults alike. So thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Nick. I'm a filmmaker here, uh, Indonesian American, based in uh, Brooklyn. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm here to talk about my new film, Daily City. Uh, my two passions in life are food and film. Uh, and my last film actually was based off my experience as a blind cook, and that film actually premiered at Tribeca in 2019 uh, and was picked up by HBO for two years. Uh, this new film called Daily City is autobiographical and about um, my childhood growing up in Daily City, California. Um, and it's basically about this one night when I was 10 years old, my mother and I were headed to a church potluck, and she basically uh, didn't have time to cook because she was, uh, you know, just got off work. And she basically told me that we we're gonna pretend that Chinese takeout was actually a traditional Indonesian dish in order to impress the largely white church community. She was so successful that uh, they brought her up on stage at the end of the night and presented her with an award. So yeah, this film, this film is about themes of exoticism, assimilation, and minority myth. And uh, yeah, I'm looking for collaborators, you know, uh, fundraising, cast, crew, uh, producers, so hit me up if you'd like to learn more about them. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Paul Chico. Uh, I am doing a pitch rather than uh, an invitation rather than a pitch. Uh, next Friday, the 30th, 6 uh, 8 30 p.m., in this space right here. 
We'll be doing a workshop called Embody Pleasure as Resistance. Some of our collaborators are here. Uh, they'll be, it'll be an exploration of nurturing our inner child through play and creative uh, and collective care through the framework of Papua, which is the Philippinex wisdom of seeing ourselves in each other. There's three segments of it. It's understanding ourselves, being in relation with each other, and being in community. And it draws upon movement and mindfulness practice, including yoga and dance. So yeah, if you are interested, would love for you to follow on IG, either my personal or uh, yoga platform. Uh, it's free donation based and the fire will be up tomorrow at Eventbrite and all of that. Thank you so much for this time and support. I'm Joyce, um, the co-host and producer of Voice on Hour, the show and podcast. So I'm here for my sister, who is Nancy, has a screening this Sunday, September 25th at 11 a.m. at the Lower East Side as a And Justine's going to play the trailer. If you have any questions, just find me after and we can chat. Hello, boys. Hello, boys. My name is Marie Lloyd Paspe. I'm the Jaden Walker Fellow this year. Thank you so much. Um, okay, hi everyone. Give it to my pitch. Next month is Philippine X American His Heritage Month, and I'm facilitating a town hall um, that centers Filipina X American futures urging the horizon to celebrate the nuances of being Filipina X American creative leaders and bearers in the performing arts specifically. Next. I'm gathering intergenerational femme and non-binary creators across disciplines. We will excavate how migration, mobility, and ownership have fueled our creative processes in white and male-dominated spaces. Filipina X creators have always been at the forefront of opportunity within our communities. However, this is a juxtaposition in the leadership roles within the performing arts today. I'm seeking femme and non-binary creators who can be panelists. I'm also seeking audience members that would love to see you there. Um, it will be the week of October 17th. And three, I'm also looking for a location that we can host this. Full hybrid, it will be in person and live. And uh, yes, please send any leads to either just me or myself. Um, I have my IG here, but my email is my name, marielcoste at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you all for sharing it and I hope um, everybody's going to stick around and talk to each other um, have a glass of wine um, pick up in the spirit of recycling and reusing and not filling our landfills um, A4 is going to be moving um, in November right so we're cleaning at our offices and we have some books and some t-shirts and some mugs and some scissors and whistles and all sorts of things for you to take home. Um, so please help yourself. Like I said, grab a grab a drink, um, talk to your friends. Feel free to um, make a donation if you so choose. And please be sure to fill out that survey because we want to know what you want us to do because we're here for you. So we're here to support you. Um, our next town hall is going to be November 15th, and that is on the subject of writing, writing poetry. Um, I'm not sure if it will take here, just depend, it depends on how crazy our moving situation is. 
but we'll let you know. So um, stay connected to us. If you're not on our mailing list, then you should be. Um, and make sure like to follow us and um, come back and make new friends tonight. So thank you all for being here. It's been great. Thank you.